The Council of Commanders of the Wagner Group has decided that the evil of the country's military leadership must be stopped. They are neglecting the lives of soldiers. They have forgotten the word justice, and we will bring it back. The chair of RT will meet Media Minister Catherine Martin this afternoon as the national broadcaster reels from the controversy over undeclared payments to Ryan Tuberty. The broadcaster on Thursday admitted to payments of €345,000 between 2017 and 2022. The issue was highlighted during an audit of RT's 2022 accounts and subsequently investigated by Grant Thornton. Philip Ryan, political editor with the Irish Independent, says there was no transparency and honesty around around what the former Late Late Show presenter was actually being paid. What the big, big problem is, especially for RTE and especially for Mr. Tobery now that he's admitted that he, he realised there was something wonky about the actual money that was going into his bank account and the figures that were being published and given to politicians as they're required to do by RTE and just published generally for the for public consumption. And, that, and that's the nub of this, is that people were not being upfront and honest about how much the country's biggest broadcaster was being paid. Ireland has seen a sustained increase in drug-involved deaths since 2017. The third meeting of the Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use is taking place in Malahide today. Drug-involved deaths have increased from 340 in 2017 to 409 deaths in 2020, with 8 in 10 deaths in 2020 involving more than one drug. The Taoiseach says Pride is a celebration of how far our country has come. The 40th Dublin Pride Parade kicked off at noon from O'Connell Street in Dublin today. Leo Varadkar has been reflecting today on the marriage referendum. I think the thing that kind of warmed my heart the most was the margin of the victory and that it wasn't just in the cities um, that we won um, in almost all the rural areas. And that's very different in other countries, you know, where they've red states and blue states. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Best birthday present ever. Give a Ryanair gift card. Mainly dry today with sunny spells, highest temperatures of 19 to 26 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until five. This is Football Saturday. And before we get to that, just say, you know, Ireland have got a couple of tries in the last few minutes in the rugby. They now lead England uh, by 34 points to 24. The conversion going over there. Hugh Cooney with the latest try. So Ireland are set for victory 65 minutes into the match there in South Africa. The first match of the under 20 uh, World Championship in Ireland are just flying. It's been a fantastic game of rugby and it's on at the moment. Uh, you can text us 53106, tweet us out off the ball. We're streaming the conversation as well. You can listen on News Talk across the country. Also watch us if you'd like on the Off the Ball digital and social channels for Twitter, at Off the Ball YouTube and on Facebook. We also podcast the show on the Off the Ball section of the Go Loud Network every week. It's also available wherever you get your pods in studio with me. Dan McDonnell of the Irish Independent. Dan, how are you? Hi, John. And we'll also have on the line Shane Keegan, the Cove Ramblers boss and the broadcaster and journalist Johnny Ward. Uh, Stephen Kenny gave an impassioned defence, Dan, of his record to a group of riders, including yourself, after the Gibraltar game. So I suppose it's our first chance to speak since he gave that speech and uh, get your kind of thoughts on it and uh, maybe your reflections on what we saw on Monday generally. Yeah, um... Yeah, the speech. I mean, well, the speech was sort of... uh, It was unusual. Um, Although, I suppose, like, what I would say is probably those of us that are used to covering Stephen Kenny teams over the years are used to how something like this happens. Like, Stephen Kenny is someone that, when he has a point in his mind and he wants to make that point in a press conference, like, he'll he'll find a way to shoehorn it in. Um, and he did this at the dock several times in the European run in 2016. You could ask him about, uh, I don't know, Dane Massey's hamstring, and it didn't matter. You'd get an answer on, you know, something completely different that he'd planned to say, and he was probably wondering, you know, just how he was going to bring it up. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think, I, I think we're probably at the point with with the uh, Stephen Kenny regime, and probably have been for some time. That I'm not sure that Anthony says or does is going to change anyone's opinion. You know, I think, you know, some people. I, I, I was striking. Like, you know, we we posted the entire transcript up, and I was actually just interested to see the reaction from the public and like some people were taking the view, uh, you know, good to see him speaking like this, you know, fighting his corner and then other people like, oh, this is embarrassing, you know and generally, you know that might have reflected their There views. are no independent voters anymore. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. Where's <laughs> where's Ross Perot here, you know um, we, need, we need to find them but um, I think I know where it comes from but I think the problem you have is that 
you know like this type of thing like Stephen Kenny's always had and I say this in, in really good faith but like he's always had a quite like an eccentric streak about him and that's always been there and I always felt when he came into the Ireland job that that would play really well if you're doing well you know but obviously if you're going badly it, it can be interpreted in a completely different reason and my feeling is where that comes from is some of the commentary arising from uh, the Athens game and and I think you know pieces or you know maybe punditry or comments about being out of his depth um, I think there's always this sort of undertone of you hear people maybe saying he's talking about inexperience and and as though he hasn't been managing for like half his life like since he was 26 he's been managing he's 51 now um, and, I, and I know that that plays to people's perception of what working in the League of Ireland is and Kenny probably felt the need to remind people that he has actually managed in some very uh, you know significant enough games and I think the point probably that it wasn't articulated by him but I guess he's trying to say that tactically he's played the role of underdog against strong teams and, and shown how he can get results in that sphere but of course the problem is you know and it's been articulated well by people you know he hasn't got results in his current job and that's um, it, it's like he's I suppose hitting back at criticism that has clearly annoyed him um, and he may be entitled I think to take issue with the tone of some of that criticism which I do think has been a little bit in parts just a little bit probably disrespectful for, for in terms of where he comes from but that shouldn't be divorced from criticism of his work in his current job which I don't think you can um, explain away by results from your past you know and this is the thing but like you know the problem you have with Stephen Kenny the problem he has himself is that um, his whole pitch for getting the job was probably based around proving to people that he should be there um, and the fact that three years later there's a sense that you're still doing that is problematic because he's never he's never going to put blame on the players that's always been his thing so I complain sometimes it's all, why is this always about Kenny it's always about Kenny after a defeat it's about Kenny after a win it's about Kenny um, but his whole thing is he's not going to shift it to the players but then that naturally puts even more focus on himself and, and he clearly felt the need to justify why he was there which isn't a great place to be in at this point Johnny Ward we haven't heard from you since the Greece and Gibraltar game so now is your chance to give your State of the Nation address here on Football Saturday yeah I don't really want to talk about it to be honest <laughs> stick around <laughs> um, for another 90 minutes here folks <laughs> yeah um, I was very deflating JD um, I was actually at a festival last weekend and uh, met our lovely producer Jojo there Shane Hannon was there so there were a few off the ball heads a lot of football heads there but as it turned out basically there was no 4G except where you were in uh, my part of the campus I managed to find I think the only place the only tent in the whole place right on the edge of uh, Glendalough so I was like this is the best thing ever game and um, it was one of the most deflating experiences in terms of sport because I just felt that um, Greece were they treated us as if we were the Ireland of old they had us at arm's length when they were um, ahead they basically sat back and just said right let's be having you when uh, we had that brief spell level they just started to dominate the game again and um, I didn't think we really had the answers and um, you know I found the whole Stephen Kenny um, you know situation since very very troubling because I have a great time for him um, I really wanted this to work out but um, I do feel we're probably at the stage now where he's um, hopefully going to see out the campaign but um, it looks like it's it's not going to work out for him and I, I do feel as well that um, I said this on our podcast with Dan during the week that you know it, it'll be it'll be damaging for Stephen if it doesn't work out because he will be seen as that guy when you cross the street not as the guy who was an amazing man Dritt and Dawk and other places um, but as the guy who basically it didn't work out with for Ireland and the mad thing is JD the, the public um, will for um, this reign has been amazing and kind of still continues to be amazing even at the game uh, against Gibraltar like over 40,000 people for effectively a dead rubber not really a, a massive kind of um, chorus of boos at half time after another poor performance and um, there's still that good will for him because I think people really wanted us to get rid of um, the shackles of the way we played the horrible style of football that we had I think people were fed up with that people actually warned him as a person as well um, I think they see his kind of innate decency the character that uh, you know he's just a humble guy he's you know he, he, I think he's very much for the worst off in society he's a guy that like he's a fascinating fellow to spend time with um, does have his eccentricities as Dan alludes to but after all this time you just can't have Athens 
Shane Keegan, were you encouraged by anything you saw in the Gibraltar game? I suppose the question I'm kind of thinking to myself is, when are we going to be competitive as a football nation again? Yeah, it looks like it could be a while off, John. Uh, first of all, I think there's great similarities there between uh, Stephen Kenny and Johnny Ward. Who you ask, you ask him about, you ask Stephen Kenny about Dan Massey, and he could go off talking about it. And you ask Johnny Ward about an Ireland game, and he tells you about his festival experience. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> segue in different directions. Um, no, look, it's 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 a fair question. Um, when are we? I suppose the key question here is when are we going to next be at a major tournament, isn't it? Um, and it is. It's it's a bit of a worry. It's a bit of a worry. Um, boys have fairly well summarised the, the the Stephen talk. Um, the one that I, the one point I would come back to, uh, probably inevitably enough, given my kind of stance on the whole Stephen Kenny thing is does drive me crazy when I hear that phrase out of his depth, um, because you can absolutely criticise his tactical decisions. You can say he got things wrong. You can say, you know, that he needs to do better. But ultimately, when you're saying out of his depth, you are referring to the fact that a League of Ireland manager should not get the Ireland job. Um, like I didn't ever, for, for any criticism that the likes of Martin O'Neill or Trapattoni or anybody like that got, they never used the phrase out of his depth, you know. And that's that's the bit that kind of grates with me. Um, and look, again, I admit, you know, <laughs> As a, a League of Ireland person, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tuned in enough to know that I, I, I certainly am never going to end up as as an Ireland manager. But I look at the likes of a Stephen Bradley um, and people like that who, you know, is doing somebody like that who's doing an absolutely outstanding job in the role. And you know, whether Stephen Stephen would never say it publicly, but you know, for the likes of Stephen Bradley or anybody else doing very well in the League of Ireland. They really needed this to work out because we've had the, the situation before where we appointed from within with Brian Kerr. You know, it's taken a hell of a long time for us to decide to, decide to go so, a similar-ish route um, with Stephen Kenny. And my God, if this one doesn't work out, I think uh, any chances of kind of homegrown managerial talent and it even goes as far as the likes of our, our underage managers the fact that Stephen was an under 21 manager for us I mean it's also going to be a case that if you know if people put forward an argument for Jim Crawford or Tom Moen or somebody like that the inevitable comeback is going to be ah should we tried that before with Kenny when we stepped him up from the 21s to the first team and it didn't work so you know it's, it's a pity on that front I think he should be just judged on his own merits and how he's doing rather than what his background is yeah I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't actually agree with that Dan sorry I, I don't necessarily agree with that Shane in the sense that um, Stephen Kenny is a he's a very unique man and um, he's you know he's come from uh, a road that was pretty un, uncheckered he got the long for job when he was like 26 27 whatever it was um, and I know Dan has said this himself but I, I don't think this should be judged as okay like the League of Ireland fraternity will be judged on the success or otherwise of Stephen Kenny because if you look at say the potential future Ireland manager Damien Duff is likely not going to have a job potentially outside of Ireland between uh, his job now and potentially get the Ireland job we've, ex we've seriously good coaches in this country there are hardly any managers from the Republic of Ireland managing in England anymore and I think the FAI board has, has behaved extremely well in this it has backed Stephen Kenny it has brought stability after you know um, a, a terribly turbulent time and I don't think it'll be rushing to any sort of a Sam Allardyce type decision the next man who oh, Johnny, yeah but Johnny Johnny, 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 are, you Johnny saying, are you saying Damien Duff can go from the Shelburne job to the Irish job potentially yeah not going to happen not not a hope Where, where's he going to go then he might he might end up as the Ireland Under manager but it won't be from it won't be from Shelburne to Ireland it'll be from Shelburne to across the water to Ireland possibly I would be absolutely stunned if Damien Duff went from Shelburne to Ireland so if Damien Duff went for the job after Stephen Kenny would he be like rejected roundly I would be very, very surprised if he was considered with just on the back of his Shelburne experience. So who are the rivals to him? Who, as in, who could get the job if he doesn't get it? Well, say, say if you look at like the other twenty ones, the under eight set up, maybe Lee Carsley. Like, where I don't, I don't see us going for this. Like Sam Allardyce. Yeah, but Johnny, character. Johnny, can I, can I just cut in there? Like, I think first of all, I, I don't think Shane was saying he was agreeing with the assertion that it would that that it would go that way. I, I know you're saying you don't agree with the idea that the homegrown managers could be real out, but I see where Shane's coming from on that. Um, there's like there's a few different points there. Like, I think 
this it does get to the, the nobody issue though like the Kenny thing was sort of in some ways viewed by people as this like I hate using the term because it was used in a different context around Kenny but like it was almost like the referendum on the homegrown manager and I think the FAI even have put themselves in a slightly tricky position because I think that Jonathan Hill at one point did make a statement already in his reign about the manager should always be uh, should always be Irish you know or, or, or Irish based even or words to that effect and a couple of people pointed out well I mean look at Vera Powell's situation at the moment and it was just something that was said um, but I, I think like it's a delicate one because I think you know you have an FEI at the moment but it's probably trying to rebuild a bit of confidence in a lot of ways um, we have the post-Brexit era situation here where we're now trying to I suppose give people collectively the confidence that you can we can, can take control of issues here at home and in the same breath then to have the perception to exist that that for managers working here it's unrealistic for them to ever to get to, t- to the top of the tree here as international manager I don't think you can have that but I think that's part of the sensitivities that, that exist here I, 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 I totally agree with Shane the, the, the term out of his depth is loaded is a loaded term you know and it is probably a loaded term and I think there's a lot of like loaded terminology used in the direction of you know that type of manager and I think Brian Kerr was probably subject to it as well um, that it wouldn't be used in the direction of other managers who've struggled and it's just this perception and a lot of people in this country have it and they feel it and they believe it it's just not elite your background isn't elite um, and you shouldn't be there but I think I think that like you know, this is sort of the fascinating element of what happens next if we sort of think that, you know, Stephen Kenny's probably maybe potentially on the last lap here unless something miraculous happens. Um, look, what happens next? Like, you see probably a lot of ex-pros very happy to come around to the idea of someone like Lee Carsley because he's someone who's operated in that game for all of his life. But the flip side is he hasn't got a huge amount of actual senior team management experience and what happens then if it doesn't work out for him like what happens if he comes in there and it's a bit of a struggle for him does it flip around then to uh, a situation whereby people are thinking oh god you know like we've we've rolled the dice here and we've gone we've gone too far one way like it's it's it can be very emotive what happens from here i think people have to think about it very carefully because there's a lot of emotion around the kenny appointment a lot of people come back to watch an international team who had probably drifted out of it and you want to keep them with you but how how it's all handled for an FEI that's trying to get everyone on side and around them the whole problem child stuff there's a lot of layers to it Okay, just gonna, thing, so JD, just 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 just, just, just Johnny, 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 just for a second, we just have to start with that. We have to just go to Cork and Cork Cross Common. Let's get an update from the All Ireland uh, preliminary quarter final. Rena Buckley. Yeah, so at the moment it's Roscommon five points, Cork three points. So Roscommon and Fairness have had the most at position, so they probably deserve their two point lead. Um, what I'd say is they're trying to run the ball um, through the Cork defence. And considering the amount of ball they've had, I think Cork have done quite well in terms of in terms of blocking them and not allowing too many scores. The standout performer so far has been in the Smith from from Ross Common. He's he's been really good in terms of his his carrying of the ball and he scored one smashing point from the outside of the right boot as well. Just he got a half yard of space and he, he put it straight over. From a Cork point of view, uh, Stephen Sherlock has got uh, one from play and one from a free, and Rory Dean is going well as well. And Ross Common are on the attack here. And they're getting a shot off from Dearman Morta, and that's his second point of the day. One from free, one from play. So as it stands here, it's six points to Roscommon, three points to Cork. Thanks so much, Rina. England 34, Ireland 34. 77 minutes on the watch in the Under-20 Rugby Championship in South Africa, the first game for Ireland in the campaign. Johnny, sorry. Not at all, Jerry. Sorry, the um, you know, in, in fairness to James McLean, he did say this afterwards that we do have a tendency to overreact. And in fairness to Shane, was it a week or two ago, you know, football betting markets are pretty accurate Ireland were 3-1 to one shots to win in Greece right we were not expected to win that game we were fairly heavy outsiders we're in a terrible terrible group and we lost the game 2-1 and we're probably roughly um, I know they're like below us in the seedings but we're probably roughly where like we should be in terms of this group at this stage we played very well against France and now we've had a hysterical reaction uh, to the game against Greece but like I have an article in the Business Post tomorrow Shamrock Rovers under 15s went to uh, Ajax last uh, Sunday I think two days after the Ireland game and won to one and you have like Ronald De Boer coming over Shamrock Rovers afterwards saying I can't believe the way you approached the game the way that you played Graham Garland that- yeah there we go Graham Garden is a man but like I think we're making great strides in Irish football but like if you look at 
Michael O'Neill, when Michael O'Neill got the Northern Ireland job, he'd managed in the third tier, I think, in Scotland. Then he got the Shamrock Rovers job, got the Northern Ireland job. But Michael O'Neill's Northern Ireland, he wasn't really trying to reinvent the wheel. He was trying to be pragmatic and getting, it was a completely a results job. Stephen Kenny has probably tried something in terms of completely changing the way we play and completely changing um, this Irish project in a relatively short space of time. And it's probably a bit, it's probably just asking too much at this stage, but the future is bright. Yeah, I just want to say as well, though, I, I probably do sl- slightly disagree agree with Shane in the sense that I think at a point not maybe not it won't be this time definitely not this time um, but I, I think Damien Duff probably will be treated a bit differently because of his playing background I think there would be that sense of that out of his depth line wouldn't be sort of it wouldn't be pitched in his direction because of his playing experience and his time working at Celtic as a as a number two or you know as a as a sort of a coach now I'm not saying it's going to be this time at all um, but I, I know that Damien Duff has said he's not particularly motivated uh, by going to say work in England again at a point um, if if they uh, had a lot of money here and they you know they somehow started winning leagues and challenging in Europe and stuff I actually wouldn't rule out Duff being a candidate at some stage and, in the future and, personally and JD and, and JD look I, I, again I hope that wasn't picked up wrong in no way am I saying that Damien Duff can't end up as an Ireland manager Damien Duff could well end up as the Ireland manager and he's having an absolutely terrific season with Shelburne I would just think that there's a middle step before he ends up in the Irish job. I think there's a hell of a chance that if if Duffer does have a, a continue to have a very strong season this year with Shells um, and maybe even one further one, I, I think some of the English clubs will come sniffing around him. Now, whether he has the motivation to go back across there and, and, and go at it, I'm not 100% sure, but I would have thought there's a, there a strong chance that that could happen, that maybe he could go across the water, potentially do a half-decent job over there and then end up in, in, in the Ireland gig. By no means did I mean that the sound that he doesn't... Uh, no, no, not I a, think he's a candidate. No, no, I think he, he has said, like, I mean, now look, Damien Duff has said he's only ever going to work for Shelburne. He said a lot of things, to be fair. Um, <laughs> but, he, but he has said definitively he wants to live in Ireland and that's why he's not interested in going that route of going to now of course that can change that can change uh, it's one of the questions I kind of think to myself look at Scotland we hammered them last year and they've had such a great run in their uh, earlier qualifiers they won all four of them they've beaten Spain they've beaten Norway are they punching above their weight are we punching below our weight I suppose are we getting the best out of the players that we have as limited as a group of players we have with all respect to them in terms of talent hmm I, I mean, I, I think that's the th- like you know, there's there's various comparisons. I mean, I see Sean O'Connor in our paper today looking through, you know, the the equivalent time of the reigns of the previous four managers and where the players were playing, how many caps they had, and like it is, you know, relative to the previous four managers. I think at this stage of a of a campaign, like it is the most inexperienced Ireland squad trying to compete. It has the f- you know the fewest number of Premier League players. Like that is a fact, you know, um, you know that that can't be avoided and. I must admit, I think there was almost two layers to the international window for me personally. Like I was watching the Greece game, and I mean, look, look, you can't defend the Greece game. Ireland tactically lost it, as well as they were. I mean, look, Greece are, are a better side at the moment. That's just the way it is. But you know, Ireland again, you couldn't say they got the best out of their options in that game because of how they were beaten. Um, the flip side was watching the game against Gibraltar on Monday, particularly the first half. And to me, okay, the tactics were changed at half time, and there was probably things you could say about the first half uh, and so on. But I must admit, the first half of the game on Monday, I was coming out and going, "Jesus, some of these players are way off it," you know. And even just the the technical execution of very basic tasks under limited pressure. And, I was, and, and clearly, the players were probably feeling a little bit of pressure coming out of Friday as well. But that was probably one for me where I was looking at going, "God, this is," you know, someone like Will Smallbone, who I'd be a big fan of. But it, it's always this point that. Lot of the Ireland players will tell you, you know, it's it's one thing to play at a certain level of club football, but there's just something different about coming to play international football. There's a bit of pressure, responsibility. Like Will Keane, for example, plays really well in club football. Yeah, so but like, but Smallbone, a particular type of player, he is just look really hesitant and and like actually Jamie McGrath, um, who you, I mean, like Jamie McGrath probably doesn't have as high a ceiling as Will Smallbone. He hasn't got to the same level of club career yet. Jamie McGrath is probably three, four years older, a little bit more experienced, and just looked more assured in that game than Smallbone. And you're thinking, yeah. Yeah, this is bad part of the point of maybe expecting young players to be ready to just ascend and take control of things straight away. So I, I actually sort of at the Gibraltar game, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, like, like it, and this is sort of my point. Uh, Stephen Kenny will probably like you know, th- there will be a change because it's like a mid-table team eventually changes you're not getting the results but there's definitely 
no guarantee whatsoever that results will improve with a change yeah. you know I yeah. think that's the point that has to be stressed but someone might find a better way but I don't think it's a case if you're looking at it going someone's going to come in here and suddenly it's we're going, going to the USA it's going to USA now <laughs> you would have players naturally who are more experienced and that's part of Kenny prepping it but uh, I just think particularly in the midfield area I think you you know you have to compensate for a way for real issues Ireland have in that department but I'm sure Shane probably has points on this well just Jerry just on on the point making of Scotland right so you know I think it's natural that we do it but we do tend to jump on you know whoever the flavour of the month is very very quickly here to, to say well they are also an underdog and they are managing to overachieve why are we not doing it so like obviously under under Michael O'Neill you know we were looking at Northern Ireland going Jesus how are they managing it um, Iceland were very much the buzz team there for quite a while um, and yet there's been very few teams that have managed to sustain it for any real period um, I get plenty of adu- abuse for continuously mentioning XG but I'm going to go there again believe it or not Scotland lost all three qualifiers on XG They've lost all three of those games on XG. So they've, they've, they've fair play to them, brilliant, and maybe it shows a serious trait in their manager or a serious trait in the side that they're able to win games that they've been second best in. But it's also a little bit of a sign of they've had a hell of a lot of luck and a couple of things managed to go in their favour because, as I say, you know, on the, on the XG, they should have zero points from those three games. They've had significantly less than 50% of the ball in all three of those games. You know, I don't know if I'd be looking to them and going, oh, look, you know, there's everything is shiny and perfect over there. That's what we need to do. I think they've just managed to to string a couple of really good results thanks to a, a you know a, a bit of luck on their side and and an ability to keep themselves in games when they're very much under the cosh. In fairness to them, Shane, if you were manager, would you play three at the back? Ireland manager. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm going on very little info there, really, Johnny. In the sense that you know. You get in, you, you do training sessions, you have a look at how the players are responding to things. Um, like I, I have to, I have to be conscious of my previous comments, Johnny. I, I when Stephen when Stephen came into the role at first, I'm pretty sure the line I took was, I think three at the back would suit Ireland better, but I don't think Stephen will ever go there because I think he's a back four man, and it's actually and and now and now. You know, what am I going to do now? Because it's the right thing to say we should be playing a back four now. Now I'm going to say, what the hell is Stephen doing playing a back three? He should be playing a back four. I mean, that would be very hypocritical of me. Um, as you know, for better or worse, I tend to go with a back three as well, which maybe that influences my thinking around things a little bit. Um, I can understand completely how people are making the argument that we need to switch to a back four at the moment. And to be honest with you, I think there's a hell of a chance he will start with a back four in the next game. Interesting. Dara Shea going to Burnley this week to so be playing Premier League football well this is the thing I mean it comes back to the balance of the squad and I suppose that's the thing like you, you can't get away from like you have a situation like Dara O'Shea has, has joined Burnley um, Nathan Collins it seems you know the, the Brentford link is definitely a legitimate one um, there's all sorts of stuff going on with finance in the Premier League and Wolves are caught up in that they seem to need, need to raise some money um, Andrew Moa Bedelli it does seem like he's going to move to a you know a higher level this summer so you're going to have this sort of situation where this is part of even the, the formation debate and, and and how you sort of square it you know the you want to play with a back four say like, let's see you want to play for the back four but Ireland may end up with four Premier League centre halves and like you know hopefully Josh Cullen, Cullen is playing but in theory if he lost his place you could have no Premier League midfielders you know and, yeah. and so it's the whole thing of you know you, you want to like you pick your best formation your best team or your best 11 and you think of like Jack Charles at the times playing good players a left back and right back just to get them in but there is actually like the nucleus of a very strong young defensive um, set up I think that will stand to Ireland in the coming years midfield like, is the problem Dan. well that's the issue I think midfield is the, the fundamental is there anybody issue. coming through in midfield in well, midfield? well I, th- I think Andrew Moran at Brighton is an exciting player but again like you know this Way is someone, it's someone who's, who's played a couple of minutes and probably needs to go on loan next season and I mean Will Smallbone again played Premier League football at a young age went on loan to Stoke and, and look I mean I think Will Smallbone would be a very good player for Ireland by the way I'm just saying that like it was obviously a big clamour for him to come in and play and then you just realise it's hard to expect someone to go in and suddenly take control at that age unless they're like a really exceptional 
always going to be in the Premier League talent. I mean, Andre Moran's exciting as a more attacking midfielder, like a number 10. That's very different to the type of more engine room midfielder that you need probably to try and control games. And that's our that's our problem. And I think, I'm, you know, that's the, the tactical issue is to almost see how you can compensate for some of your weaknesses. And I think there's no doubt that Ireland have an issue in that department. Shane, sorry. And, and JD, even and JD, even the way even the way we ask that question as a, as a, as a football public, when you say the question, have we anybody coming through in midfield? I mean, what a, when, a, when a manager is thinking like that, or when a club is thinking about a player's development, you know what they're saying is, have they any have we anybody coming through at the moment who's twenty twenty one years of age, who by the time they are 24 years of age, can be a, a regular starter, a star in our team. When we ask that question, it seems to be like, we need the Evan Ferguson version of a midfielder now. You know, we need a 19-year-old to come out of absolutely nowhere yeah. and establish himself as, as the centre midfielder we can build the team around. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Okay. <laughs> 34 points apiece. <laughs> well, it did actually happen when Declan Rice came out of nowhere in the space of uh, 18 months. But anyway, let's not, let's not talk about that. He was a, he was a centre Declan. half. And then all of a sudden he was like, uh, yeah. Nathan Collins got a bit of the better of the better. Ah, but here we go. This is what everyone does now. Everyone starts going, which of our defenders can play on <laughs> midfield? It's like all of a sudden, like he's, he's, he's facing the opposite direction, receiving the ball. And it's like, let's see how that goes, lads. Like the, this, the, this big thing people have, like, oh, he, he can play a midfield field it's like I don't know does it come from our GA thing of like put their best player in midfield I, I don't know where that comes from but uh, I'm not seeing it with any of our of our centre yeah. halves at the moment I don't know if if, if, the, yeah. if the lads have a different well, view we, could any of them step in there I, I could see someone like Dar O'Shea playing left back for Ireland you know I could see something like right that because he actually when he was that could be a way to like accommodate some of these players in but um, I'm not sure if they're going to suddenly become the, the midfield lynch okay now. gotta take a break uh, 34 points apiece Ireland and England have dropped in the Rugby Under-20 Championship in South Africa, the first game of the campaign. We'll get an update from Marina Buckley as well on Cork and Ross Common after this on Football Saturday. Off the Ball on News Talk. Brace yourself for a heart-stopping adventure like no other. The News Talk Summer Tour is back and it's time to unleash the thrill. Fasten your seatbelts, folks, because this is one action-packed ride you won't want to miss. Are you guys feeling okay? Get ready for an adrenaline-fueled journey through the stunning landscapes of Ireland. Can you stop with the voices? I'm trying to drive. Sorry. Sorry. To find the adventure near you, see Newstalk.com forward slash summer tour. Please stop. Two, three, two. Three simple numbers. But for Audi, they signify more. More innovation and excitement. An invitation to experience progress you can feel. And a shift in mindset to greater expectations. Like the competition edition on the Audi A4 and A5 S-Line models. All part of our 232 range. Discover how progress makes you feel in a 232 Audi. And book a test drive today. Hi, David Keeling here. At Keeling's, we like to work in harmony with nature, which includes looking after our little friends, the bees. Our Keeling's Great Rewilding Project aims to help reverse the declining population of bees and other friendly pollinators, and we'd love you to join us. There are lots of ways to rewild your garden. Why not plant window boxes and hanging baskets with colourful flowers? Bees especially love the purple and blue ones. Visit keelingsgreatrewilding.ie for more really easy ideas. Keeling's love to grow. Bosch, appliances you can rely on. For peace of mind, choose from Bosch's five-year warranty range of home appliances. For more information, go to paracity.ie. T's and C's apply. Scammers are targeting people nationwide with fraudulent messages claiming to be from eFlow. These scams are becoming more common, more sophisticated, and more likely to result in the theft of personal financial information. eFlow does not send links and text messages. If you receive a text like this, delete it immediately. EFLOW has not been compromised or subjected to a data breach. Your information is safe. Let's keep it that way. For more, go to eflow.ie. 
You've just woken up in your suite at the five-star Paris Court Hotel, gazing up at the spectacular Sugarloaf Mountain, when the doorbell rings and the most incredible breakfast is ushered into your room. Yesterday, you enjoyed the beautiful Paris Court Estate and fabulous Sika restaurant. But today is all about the pool and some serious espa pampering. Take time out this summer at the five-star Paris Court Hotel Resort and Spa. Visit pariscourthotel.com. And Sean's nipped into the bar for a quick chat with the work crowd. He won't stop. He has a match in the morning. But wait, a nod from the barman. There's Guinness 00, zero on tap. The chats are back on. Sean is in full swing and a fresh pint is handed over the bar. Guinness 00, zero. 100% Guinness, 0% alcohol. Proud partner of Pro Park Stadium and proud partner of the GAA. Visit drinkaware.ie. We're celebrating summer in the most extraordinary way, and that's with an extraordinary sale, only at Kildare Village. We're celebrating with even more spectacular savings and your favourite designer brands. We're celebrating with new pop-ups and a mouth-watering choice of eateries, and we're making it easy for you to celebrate with free parking, late opening, and new activities and surprises at every turn. Celebrate summer with us at the extraordinary sale, now on at Kildare Village, where the possibilities are endless. See the whole picture with Ultra Wide on iPhone 11. Join 3 today and get iPhone 11 for just 9 99 with 3 bill pay. Enjoy top class speeds in Ireland's fastest 5G network. Offer ends soon. Visit in store or at 3.ie. 3 for a better connected life. 40 euro per month price plan. Subject to 24 month minimum term and annual price increase. Terms and conditions apply. Based on analysis by Ookla Speed Test Intelligence Data Q3 to Q4 2022. Who said electrification can't spark excitement? From introducing Ireland's first EV to redefining the family car, Nissan has always led from the front. And now we're breaking new ground once more with ePower, Nissan's unique hybrid driving system, fueled by petrol, driven by electric, no need to recharge, giving you the pleasure of electric driving without the need to plug in. New Nissan Qashqai and X-Trail with ePower. Drive it to believe it at your nearest Nissan dealer. Nissan. Innovation that excites. Off the ball. This is News Talk. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball here on News Talk. John Duggan with the three to five on Football Saturday for the earlier time of two to half three this week. Uh, Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent in studio with us on the line. The broadcaster and journalist Johnny Ward and the Cove Ramblers manager Shane Keegan in the Camogie. Kilkenny two nine Dublin seven points in the football. Ross Common seven points. Cork three. We we'll got a half time from Rena Buckley down at Porky Cueve shortly in the rugby. Ireland thirty four, England thirty four. Uh, we have a World Cup squad announcement. Dan from Vera Pau on Thursday, uh, trimming the squad to twenty three. So. Uh, uh, a lot of calls for her to be made. A lot of broken hearts this week uh, after the, the Zambia result of 3-2 when you were down at Tala. Yeah, it might even be Wednesday that squad announcement right. now, but um, I think it was meant to be Thursday, but there might have might be some debate over when it actually is. But either way, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a strange one. Like I, I've, I think Shane, I know Shane was at the game as well. Like um, probably going to some of those women's international games it's such a different event right like it's so many kids at the event and this isn't a criticism of it it's actually the reflection of something that's growing it's something that's been born as we speak it's like a whole generation of probably match going people you know being being created here you know and as a result I think in a way sometimes like the discourse around the team is still developing in the sense of like the personalities the characters and you know it's such a like very happy event everyone's enjoying themselves at the game yet you could clearly see the individual players like this is everything to them I mean being on this plane there's only there's only one first time you know like yeah. this, this is like these are the history makers and yes Vera Pau's job is to write some people out of that history um, come Wednesday you know and and I think when she named her initial squad um, I was struck by like there was all this comments about oh it was tough making some calls yet the pieces around it no one was naming names because it felt like everyone who probably deserved to be in contention was in that list of 31 or whatever it was that sort of general number whereas now like a couple of people during the week are going to be told no like this isn't for you and you know that's that's going to be difficult and I mean I was struck watching the game the other day I ended up doing my piece for the end of just around Leanne Kiernan someone who would have um 
I suppose a couple of years back you know the idea of an Ireland team in 2023 say being in this situation and her not being in the squad probably would have been unthinkable she had a long term injury um, she was trying to do all the right things the other day and probably got into some dangerous positions but nothing quite went right for her she goes off at half time someone comes you know Amber Barrett comes on and scores a couple of goals and you're thinking you know you, could, you wouldn't be human if you weren't thinking God is that my chance gone so it's it's real pressure and it's even really pronounced like I'm even making this point like FIFA have even put up proper like prize money individual prize money for 28 grand so for each individual player and there's going to be different sponsorship top stuff on top of that as well now I don't know what way the FEI are doing and who knows they might look after players who just miss out I don't know what way it'll happen uh, I have no knowledge or information on that but like in the women's game like that's big money you know like it's still a very early developing thing where that could be someone's a year's salary more than a year's salary in some cases so you know the price of being in that plane there's there's the natural there's the symbolic aspect and that's that, that's foremost in everyone's mind but there's just a lot of other things in, in people's minds as well too so I really don't envy her making that decision but again she's paid to be unsentimental and that's just what you got to do and they've recruited all these they've recruited some new players in the last year to strengthen the team and you just have to be ruthless about it as a manager and do that but the the cost of that will be some people missing out who've been on the journey but yeah and I imagine that's going to be difficult uh, Shane you were there on uh, Thursday and Amber Barris booked her place on the plane has to must be on the plane now um, she was outstanding, John. I thought she was she was the best player on the pitch by a country mile once once she came on. Um and she probably needed to be because she hasn't um she hasn't seen a whole lot of football at, at club level. I think I, I might have seen somewhere that this was her first goal since the last time she scored for Ireland. Oh, wow. Um yeah, she she was she was brilliant. Talk about taking the leading the charge to to an opposition that she just has an, a, br- a brilliant brilliant ability to get the team up the field and and fight off scraps and fight for everything. So even I would uh, to be honest with you, you could remove the two Amber Barrett goals and I would still have said that she was hands down um, player of the match. I thought she was brilliant. The other two that probably in my opinion caught the eye and and certainly enhanced her chances I thought I thought Abby Larkin was very good I thought she again she carries the ball very well very very direct Um, I was impressed with her and then the other one and maybe again maybe it's a certain angle that I'm coming from on this but I I, again delighted to see Clara Reardon score a goal Um, and I thought she was very very impressive I think she gives the side very good balance Claire was believe it or not Claire was at, at Wexford Youths with Wexford Youths women's team when I was down there as as, as uh, the men's manager and we actually um, myself herself and Rihanna Jarrett actually ran a, a, a summer camp together for a few weeks down there for Wexford um, and I found her to be excellent but at the time John it's amazing at the time she was an out and out centre forward an out and out centre forward she was like top goal scorer or near enough top goal scorer in, in the women's league of Ireland kind of two or three seasons consecutively before she headed off for Germany I think and it was when she got over there that they kind of redeployed her to centre back um, but she looks completely at home there now she's there a while she's playing centre back a good while now this is is not something she's only doing the last six months or anything but uh, she got a, she's got a couple of bad injuries she's bounced back from them really well and I think she's given herself a real real chance now Got to take a half time update now from Porky Cueve Cork against Roscommon in the football championship Brina Buckley Yeah so it's Roscommon seven points Cork six points so Roscommon have been consistent all the way through the game um, I suppose they got off to a good start they, they led two points to, to one after three minutes and they, they've been consistent I suppose they've had more possession throughout the game In the Smith has stood out for them he's been excellent he had a, a, a smashing point from the outside of his boot on the on the 11th minute and he had a goal chance on the 22nd minute after some fantastic interplay from Roscommon his shot probably wasn't the best shot he ever hit it was hit a bit high maybe and Mihaly Martin managed to, to get a hand to it and save it and the last point that Roscommon scored was on the 26th minute and um, they've scored three from play and four from freeze Cork started brightly in the first half and after 14 minutes they had three points on the board they went through a bit of a sparse, a sparse patch thin and they didn't score again between they didn't score between the 14th minute and the 33rd minute so she, or Stephen Sherlock got a free on the 33rd minute and I suppose the difference for the last few minutes was that Cork started winning Roscommon's kickouts 
and they scored three points in the last three minutes one from Sherlock from a free one from Tommy Walsh who's named the cornerback and one from Matty Taylor the, the attacking wing back so as it stands at half time Cork have had a resurgence in the last five minutes which was badly needed and Cork are six points and Ross Common deservedly I would say are one point ahead at seven points thanks so much Rita Buckley down there Porky Cueve lots of text in here at 53106 the cost of 30 cent if the Irish soccer team had a few carry GA players they would be a lot better physically stronger faster and with more heart uh, what about Chris Hutton's prospects of becoming a future Ireland senior manager discuss uh, I, w- I would say that time has potentially passed he's taken the Ghana job now as well but um, yeah we, we always have this argument about uh, we have all these world class GA stars who could revolutionise our football team I'm, I'm not convinced but um, yeah Adrian and Leach in touch hi John I think it's fair to say my, my be like most Irish fans now I'm honest I'm sick of the whole Stephen Kenny show just let him manage the team I was behind him changing the style of football and starting afresh but now it's lose a game sack him he's out of his depth he doesn't have the players win a game it's oh a few results we could qualify I can see the change now uh, any of those young defenders have any ball ability for midfield like England moving Trent says Bernard and Leash uh, lads it's not the team with the most possession that wins the game it's the team that scores the most goals that wins it and it doesn't mean you need to have the most possession to score a goal you just need to get this enough to get the scores Scotland may have not had the most possession over their games but they did have enough possession that got the goals that won the games to John and Kilkenny XG is in possession though in fairness for Shane to make that point it's, it's calculated in different ways I was offered Kenny but I think once the group is over it'll be time to move on I know you can say look at the group we got but the reality of the situation is we dropped down a pot because of the results under Kenny so he has to be held responsible at some stage says Damien and Cork and Dan it comes from uh, to have zero good level midfielders it comes from Mark Lawrence and Paul McGrath doing great jobs there in the past it comes from Nathan Collins Dara Shea being on the ball more and that any of our midfielders because three centre halves have nothing to do with themselves back there and for me it also comes to Nathan Collins there's loads of football in him be well able to adapt to a defensive midfield role also it's not about just playing a back three or back three it's about being flexible to play both says Sean and Sligo yeah I don't know I, I, I wouldn't personally be seeing it in Collins myself actually just just with some of his attributes like I, I understand the idea of certain white defenders go in to play in midfield and I totally see it like Declan Rice for example and, and how that worked but just Collins wouldn't be one for me I don't know Shane has any of our def- defenders appealed to you as midfielders? No, I, I'd agree with you, uh, Dan, really, based on, on the skill set there. Like, to be honest with you, Jedi, I think it's a hell of a lot easier for them to move in the opposite direction. Um, you look at how good Rodri was for, for Spain at the World Cup. Um, yeah, I think it's a hell of a lot easier for, for a centre midfielder to uh, maybe as his years progress, or in Rodri's case, just because of an abundance of talent in one particular position, to, to switch back to um, to centre back. Centre, there's no, look, there's no doubt about it. Centre midfield is the hardest position on the field to play um, it really really is and I understand that most of these players like you did, the example that we gave there you know in the GEA playing your strongest player at centre back most of these players probably did play at centre midfield at some stage in their schoolboy careers because that's where you put your best player and inevitably they were probably their best player at their clubs but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a serious serious move from centre back to move into centre midfield it becomes you know it just expands from a 180 degree game to a 360 degree game and that's that's completely you know a completely different remit yeah I think I think of Collins the goal in the Ukraine I think Collins is someone who's particularly confident even when he's in the right of the three like striding on and seeing the game ahead of him but I'm just not sure if that you play with Ben Mee and Burnley uh, Collins would have probably played with Ben Mee and Burnley yeah, I think. He, he yeah. can, can, if he gets the Brentford I think that'd be a great move for him because they're, they're really well coached I know I can see I can see, yeah, I can see that move appealing um, and he's a very like I'm a huge Nathan Collins fan like I'm a little bit disappointed still it seems like Wolves have viable reasons for wanting to raise money and, and they've just sold Neves to, to Saudi you know um, there's all sorts of weird things going on with Wolves about Lopetegui that he needed assurances financially to stay and they've just decided you know, Connor Cody's coming back and, and he's an asset they can sell um, Collins it's still a little bit disappointing because he's like he's now moving on to like uh, what like his sort of his fourth club in a very short space of time but um, but still for me like a great career ahead of him but for me as, as a centre half One of our YouTube commenters I appreciate this thanks for all the great work during the season you, you guys kept me company in my Sunday morning runs says Peter thank you Peter for listening this is the last football Saturday until August the 12th I don't know what we're going to do apart from uh, giving Dan and Johnny and Shane a well deserved break uh, Johnny did you pick anything out of the League of Ireland last night you uh, you enjoyed oh, it was absolutely phenomenal like um, 
I worked at Limerick Races today and yesterday, so I, um, you know, I was kind of getting the second half of the Rovers Bowes game, which was perfect. Um, phenomenal stuff, you know, the the quality of the goals. Um, Jonathan Afalabi is an interesting story as well. I know Dan is a big fan of him. Um, he's kind of had a checkered start to his Bowes career, but his second half performance last night, first goal, like, I mean, that's the sort of thing that's, you, you know, that sort of instinctive uh, finish that, like, if, if you uh, do that as a young player, you're like, wow, and he's like, no backlift at all, straight in off the post, unsavable, sets up the second goal as well. Rovers go from position where they look like they're in an unassailable lead, so barely holding on for two all. And then you have this mad story of Damien Duff who has become um, almost like uh, the, I suppose the most reluctant ambassador of the League of Ireland but where he basically has uh, a gesture um, as you would interpret it at the uh, St. Pat's fans at the end who, who have taken a lot of pleasure in, um, have, in winding Damien Duff up but you've this amazing goal from Jake Mulraney to win the Dublin Derby um, you've Derry City as well obviously uh, coming back to form by winning and um, I think Galway United now thanks to Shane Keegan partly um, are 100% certain to uh, qualify into the Premier Division next season because the gap is now 13 points and this should not go uh, unnoticed people say that how can a media how can a manager like to do so much work in the media as Shane Keegan does Shane Keegan has brought Cove to his third place in the table with a small budget playing good football and uh, they beat Waterford last night which is a hell of an achievement possibly the, the highlight of the entire night Yeah I mean I think it, in fairness to Shane that is a big achievement again that was another Stephen Kenny style answer from Johnny where it started off that question started <laughs> it was off a somewhere Kenny style question and I don't know where it ended up um, but Shane did in fairness he's modestly he did mastermind a pretty uh, pretty big win last night Shane to be fair so do your victory lap now Shane tell us tell us, big Sam style tell us how you did it Ma- masterminding the victory uh, <laughs> to say uh, that's probably not the case for anybody who was there now is, is put it mildly we were uh don't don't get me wrong. We worked our socks off. We absolutely you were lucky. Is that what you're saying? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, again, again, XG tells me we should have been comprehensively beaten, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and there you know how go. much of a believer you know how much of a believer I am in XG. What was your possession <laughs> like? Was it a, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. It was pretty low now. And um, I look again. Our our lads did brilliantly. Wilson, who uh, Johnny knows well, who we have a loan from Galway, so there's a bit of bit of irony in the fact that a man on loan from Galway with us has, has scored a goal to beat Galway's closest rivals and as Johnny says probably made the gap insurmountable for Watford at this stage Wilson scored an unbelievable goal JD he really really did and you could argue we deserve to, to win the game based on the strength of that goal alone but uh, again if I'm going to be completely honest um, they had a goal disallowed in the 95th minute for offside which on second look, looks as though it may have been onside. If I'm completely honest, uh, if I'm completely honest in that respect, but we'll take the rub of the green when we get it, JD. That's can for I, sure. Can I ask you, Shane? Is this the most like pleasuring, like the most enjoyable thing as a manager? You've won your last three games one nil. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jay, uh, very simple, Johnny. The reason the answer to that is yes is because I have to drive home with the goalkeeper. So As it, makes his, it makes his company a hell of a lot better in the car when he's driving home with a smile on his face and his uh, his clean sheet. Are you in the back? Of the, are you in the back? Like a kind of a, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, saying nothing, just silence in the back in your on your phone or whatever. <laughs> That's it. Do, do he has a bad one. Coffee here, or like you know. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. has a bad one. He has to try and avoid making contact with me for an hour and forty minute dri- so drive. So it's like a coffee and a muffin, and you're throwing on the muffin, and yeah. 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 <laughs> it is a nice story though Lee Stacey JD because like um, I had the joy of having a lift home with Lee from the game in Galway where they lost 1-0 but played very well and he was in this position and it's a strange one as a League of Ireland player if you're not going to play full time if you if you play part time you're basically going to make next to no money you're going to make expenses but you have that love of the game so Lee had options in the Premier Division which would have entailed maybe sitting on the bench maybe earning slightly more money and maybe uh, you know he lives in Dublin so maybe like living closer to where he works but Shane Keegan said I, I'll give you this option and you know it goes against like as you want to coach I think he, what is he he goes down and trains you once a week Shane is it? 
That's it, yeah. So so he tries to sort out. We had a chat with, with Pat when Tim was there. That's kind of slightly gone now. But we, we try and sort out a Dublin-based session for him on a Monday, JD. And then he, he drives halfway down. He drives from Dublin down to Leash and meets me in Leash on a Wednesday and comes the rest of the way down with me. So we only have him for the one the one session. Look, I think it's it's just about manageable and doable with a goalkeeper, I think, providing you've got a, a really good second-choice keeper who understands the situation. It, it'd be a hell of a lot harder to work with an outfielder, I think, you know. Okay, um, we got about a minute left. Is that enough yeah, time to talk well, about Damien Duff? Is there? Oh uh, yeah, no. the, the Damien Duff was like. I mean, the thing with Damien Duff last night was he didn't know he'd been sent off, so he he, <laughs> he was dismissed after the final whistle. And, and uh, I was working at the game, and basically, me and a couple of other reporters, we had to wait around till the referees come out to clarify that Damien Duff had been red carded because it wasn't produced there was no physical red card none of that cheer from the fans when the red card is produced um, but it turned out he did get a red card after the final whistle even if he didn't know about it so um, I suppose there's probably an element of watch this space to see what comes of it because people, a lot of people might have seen the clip online he did gesture towards the fans first a lot of Pats fans online are saying they thought it was funny rather than being grossly offended and not calling for some big ban or something but clearly a, a red card is a red card so we'll see how it pans out but there's always okay. there's always a story uh, i got to take a break um, it's on the screen that Johnny is the chair of the Don DC fan club so after three we will hear um, the kind of uh, reaction to the Don DC viral moment from uh, from Johnny uh, Dan and Shane after the news on Football Saturday we're back after that and also we'll have an update after the break on Cork and Roscommon in the Football Championship so don't go away <laughs> This weekend, News Talk are proud to support our official car partner, Volkswagen, as the platinum sponsor of Dublin Pride. To celebrate, visit newstalk.com forward slash pride for your chance to win a two-night stay at Carton House. Follow at News Talk FM on Instagram for the latest videos from our presenters, reporters and team behind the scenes. News Talk. Conversation that counts. We spend much of our lives waiting. Waiting for someone to talk to. Thank you for holding. Waiting in line. Next! And waiting for the sun to shine. But if you're holding on for the right EV, your wait is over. Because the Kia EV6 is now waiting for you at your local Kia dealer. A triumph of design, space and range. The award-winning EV6 is the car that changes everything. So what are you waiting for? Visit Kia.com to book your test drive. Kia. Movement that inspires. Morning fresh espresso under cypress trees. Cruise glistening seas around the island of Capri. Family fun in the Sicilian seaside sun. There are many sides to Italy. We'll help you discover them. Discover the family side of Italy with Top Flight. And book your Italian holiday today at topflight.ie. Insure my van.ie. Hi, I'm Ken Doherty. For all van drivers and business owners, insuremyvan.ie is Ireland's low-cost van and commercial insurance specialist. For high-quality van and all commercial insurances, call insuremyvan.ie. City Financial Marketing Group Limited trading as insuremyvan.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. At Centra, feel good and shop smart with great offers this week. Like Centra Fresh Arch Lamb Leg 1.2 Kilo, only 9.99. Kellogg's Special K and Crunchy Nut 500 gram now half price. And in our French wine sale, rare vineyard Sauvignon Blanc and Malbec, 9 euro each. Centra. Live every day. Enjoy alcohol sensibly. Right now at Power City, claim up to 300 euro cash back when you purchase selected Neff home appliances. To find out more, go online to powercity.ie. Dream big this summer with the Easy Living Interiors Summer Sale. Dream of luxury leather sofas and premium dining sets, eclectic lounge chairs, plush beds, and and accessories. Dream of a stunning garden with free delivery on our biggest collection of garden furniture and then make your dreams come true with our flexible finance options and expert interiors advice. Easy Living Interiors. Cork, Dublin, Navin, Nace, Wexford, Waterford, Carlo, Drogheda and opening soon in Gulliver's Retail Park. Summer sale ends soon. You've imagined the car journeys you'll take, from meeting old friends to visiting the folks to just getting away on new adventures. 
Now it's time to bring your plans to life with a new car. With a car loan from Permanent TSB and online approval in minutes, you can stop imagining your journeys and start taking them. Apply for a car loan at PermanentTSB.ie today. Online approval in minutes applies to current account salary mandated customers registered for online banking for loans up to €25,000. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply, subject to affordability assessment. Security may be required. Permanent TSB PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Your voice matters and your vote is important. Local authorities are updating the electoral register and it's your responsibility to ensure that your details are current and correct. Even if you're already registered to vote, now is the time to check and either confirm or update your details by providing your PPSN, air code and date of birth. To have your say on shaping Ireland's future, you must be on the electoral register. Checking is easy. Simply go to checktheregister.ie. The easy way to secure your say. Brought to you by the Government of Ireland. You've just woken up in your suite at the five-star Paris Court Hotel, gazing up at the spectacular Sugarloaf Mountain, when the doorbell rings and the most incredible breakfast is ushered into your room. Yesterday, you enjoyed the beautiful Paris Court Estate and fabulous Sika restaurant. But today is all about the pool and some serious spa pampering. Take time out this summer at the five-star Paris Court Hotel Resort and Spa. Visit pariscourthotel.com. Design driven by impulse, performance in tune with your emotions, an instant connection, electric. At Cooper, we believe in galvanizing these instincts. It's why the Cooper Born, our 100% electric model, looks, feels and behaves unlike anything else on the road. Start seeing what's possible and go full electric with the Cooper Born. Act on your impulse. Test drive today. Own it tomorrow. Search Cooper Official. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's three o'clock. This is Ken Murray. Good afternoon. Security is being tightened in Moscow after infighting between Russian forces and a private army. People in the southern city of Rostov have been urged to stay indoors after Vladimir Putin accused the boss of the Wagner mercenary group of treason. Wagner's Yevgeny Prigozhin claims Russia bombed his men in Ukraine, where they're meant to be fighting side by side. The Council of Commanders of the Wagner Group has decided that the evil of the country's military leadership must be stopped. They are neglecting the lives of soldiers. They have forgotten the word justice, and we will bring it back. The chairwoman of RTE will meet Media Minister Catherine Martin this afternoon as the national broadcaster reels from the controversy over undeclared payments to Ryan Turbidy. The broadcaster on Thursday admitted to payments of €345,000 between 2017 and 2022. The issue was highlighted during an audit of RTE's 2022 accounts and subsequently investigated by Grant Thornton. Philip Ryan, political editor with the Irish Independent, says there was no transparency and honesty honesty around what the former Late Late Show presenter was actually being paid. What the big, big problem is, especially for Orty and especially for Mr. Tobery now that he's admitted that he, he realised there was something wonky about the actual money that was going into his bank account and the figures that were being published and given to politicians as they're required to do by Orty and just published generally for the for public consumption. And, that, and that's the nub of this, is that people were not being upfront and honest about how much the country's biggest broadcaster was being paid. Ireland has seen a sustained increase in drug-involved deaths since 2017. The third meeting of the Citizens' Assembly on drug use is taking place in Malahide today. Drug-involved deaths have increased from 340 in 2017 to 409 deaths in 2020, with 8 in 10 deaths in 2020 involving more than one drug. The Taoiseach says Pride is a celebration of how far our country has come. The 40th Dublin Pride Parade kicked off at noon from O'Connell Street in Dublin today. Leo Varadkar has been reflecting on the marriage referendum. I think the thing that kind of warmed my heart the most was the margin of the victory and that it wasn't just in the cities um, that we won um, in almost all the rural areas. And that's very different in other countries, you know, where they've red states and blue states. And that's your news. It's two minutes past three. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Support Ireland's athletes at the World Champs in August with Ryanair's low fare flights to Budapest. 
Outbreaks of rain and drizzle will develop in the west tonight. The rain will extend eastwards and become heavier overnight, although the east will stay dry until morning. Lowest temperatures of 13 to 15 degrees in a moderate to fresh southerly wind. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. This is Off the Ball until 5. John Duggan with you. Let's get an update from Porky Cueve. Cork and Ross Common in the All Ireland Football Championship. Brina Buckley. Yeah, and it's Cork leading for the first time. So at the 48th minute, they kicked their nine point through Chris Oak Jones, and it's Ross Common eight points. So since half time, Cork has got three, so they've gone from three points to nine points, and Ross Common have got one. But I suppose the big talking point was that Ross Common had a. An excellent goal chance. It was worked between Bino Carroll and Dierman Morta. Dierman Morta had the final shot and was saved by saved by Michal A. Martin. Um, so a real tight game. Great start to the second half. And Ross Common have actually just levelled the fairs now. So it's nine points each on the 43rd minute. Brilliant stuff, Rina. Thank you so much. In the minor football championship semi-final, carry six points. Modern five, a latest score from O'Connor Park. In the Camogie halftime, Dublin seven points, Kilkenny 2-10. Ireland drew with England 34 points apiece in rugby's world under 20 championship in South Africa. Now, let's hear the viral moment of the week for the nation, uh, delivered brilliantly by Ashley O'Reilly in conversation with Don Deasy. Do you think Stephen Kenny should stay on? 500%. A great manager and a great man. He hasn't got the players, but he's a brilliant, brilliant manager. What do you like about him? Everything. Everything. There's nothing bad about him. He's a very honest and good man. There's a friend of mine there, Jonathan oh, Corbett, chairman are. of Galway United, and he thinks he's useless. He's not useless. He hasn't got the players. He's brilliant. So he needs more time, you think? Definitely. Without a doubt. And he deserves it. He's an Irishman, and he's looking after an Irish team. And we don't need foreigners to look after an Irish team. Do you, have you seen improvements under Stephen Kenny? I definitely. At least they're playing football. You've seen them under Martin O'Neill and Ray Keane. We're just kicking it up the air. They're worse than Jack Charlton. Will you stop? Jesus, he's brilliant. <laughs> they're passing the ball. Yeah, but they're, but they're not getting the win. I know they're not. He's very unlucky. No, he's very <laughs> unlucky. Yeah, he is really. Ah, he deserves another chance. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. He's a decent, honest man yeah. and a good manager. And he talks, he, the, the way he sees it, he talks. And he, 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 you know, mm. there, he's not hiding behind anybody. He's not making excuses like some of the bollockses, you know. So when you heard some people this week, maybe the Irish public saying that he needs to go, how did you feel about that? I felt terrible, hurt, really hurt and broken hearted. I'd rather have left my wife than see him go. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping she doesn't see this. No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> she might leave me then. She might be better off. But I'm telling you. Yeah, oh, hey, my friend, look, he's hiding over there. He should go. He has to. He's hoping they'll be beaten tonight. I don't care whether they're beaten or not. He's an Irishman. He should be kept on. Yeah. And don't let him go. Will they win tonight? Definitely. Without a doubt. And whether they do or not, he's still a good manager. Have you been always following Ireland? All, all my life. Yeah, my brother played for them. Oh, right. Who's he your did? brother? Eamon DC. He was a fellow who played with Aston Villa, yeah. Very good. Yeah, I could have played with them too, but I drank for Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> that was a problem then. No, no, it got no, in the no. way. I got on the better side. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, right? Thanks a million. He died and I'm still alive. Oh, God. <laughs> The colourful Don DC, who uh, I think put a smile on everybody's face this week. We got, I think we got a photo. Uh, do we have a photo of um, of Don? I'm just checking our producer there. Uh, do we have a photo of Don? Uh, can we put that up on the screen? It's uh, Don DC with an off the ball umbrella and uh, Michal Murphy, Nathan Murphy's father there. It must be a goal away, so. Game last night. I think Johnny Ward was sending me various pictures of Don last night, so. So a, a friend of mine did send, when that clip came out the other day, did suggest that that was basically Johnny Ward in 2045. <laughs> the um, which I thought was, uh, was a pretty good line. Johnny Ward, you know this man well. Yeah, I don't think Don liked that comparison at all, actually. Um, and he certainly won't want me to, um, you know, be a Don DC. He's just an absolute legend. Like, this is my relationship with Galway City, JD. You listen to Don DC talking there, and you're like, that is literally Galway City uh, in two minutes of an interview. I thought Ashling uh, did the interview very well. She uh, just let him roll. Um, his brother was a serious, serious yeah. footballer. Like, came back to play for Galway United, basically played for nothing. I think the banner in uh, Terryland is um, gave everything, asked for nothing. 
Ewing died very young. Don has lost a couple of other brothers as well. He's had um, you know a lot of uh, personal tragedy in his life, and he always has a smile on his face. And um, I thought it was hilarious. He's throwing Jonathan Corbett under the bus. I think was slightly questionable. Jonathan Corbett then seen uh, hiding under said bus a few minutes later, trying to um, you know get away from it all. Um, I think Johnny Corbett was slightly taken aback by how viral this went, and it went incredibly viral. But uh, he's an absolute legend on DC. I can't uh, can't say enough about him. And what you see there is exactly what you uh, get when you meet him in Terryland or meet him in Galway. And I think he epitomises what Galway is. It's um, just real, real uh, heart, crack, love of football, love of sport, love of life. And um, yeah, we're lucky to have him. And you were a Galway man- United manager, Shane. I was um, yeah I threw it up on, on Twitter my only surprise is that it's taken this long for Don DC to go viral to be honest <laughs> with you the, the first the first time I uh, ever encountered Don I knew this was a fairly unique individual that uh, needs his own TV show from the off yeah he put my my first I threw it up on Twitter JD my, my first um, engagement with Galway United was, was their Christmas party and uh, the aforementioned Jonathan Corbett rang me and said uh, listen I have I'm somewhere sorted for you to stay there Don DC says he'll put you up I said who the hell is Don DC so uh, I met Don the first night down there at the Christmas party anyway he's got that uh, infectious laugh that he has that's for sure but uh you know, reads uh, as you can imagine, a Christmas party, quite a bit of alcohol consumed. Woke up the following morning, not in the greatest of health, and there's a, a knock on the bedroom door, and Don sticks the head in. He says, uh, "Shane, Shane, I have a, I have a Christmas present for you." He comes in with the biggest slab of fresh salmon I have ever. <laughs> now he is the only man I have ever seen give somebody a big giant slab of fresh salmon as a Christmas present. I have to say, now this was massive. But uh, I glad we gladly took it home and used it. But you'd want to be he's 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 absolutely brilliant, JD. But I'll tell you, you'd, you'd want to be able for him. The man does not <laughs> mince his words. I uh, as 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 Johnny Ward will attest to my old time at Galway United didn't go that as well as I would have liked. And to this day, any time I see Don DC, the first line out of his mouth is, Hey, Keegan, you getting anyone relegated these days, are you? <laughs> 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 so his brother it's the best city yeah. in the world Jenny. It's, well it's, it's, Eamon DC it's Park I mean that's the thing it's yeah. like people like yeah. you know I know Johnny still uh, sort of refers to it as Tyrion but I mean you're reading the sports bullet and it's, yeah. it's Eamon DC Park you know and it's just that whole you know the the name sort of resonates and like you know he was at Aston Villa around the time Aston Villa were winning you know winning the league winning trophies, European, Cup, European yeah. Cup and and when the squads were smaller that was the thing yeah. when you have like a twelve man squad or a fourteen man squad so um, he was a top class player I've read some great pieces about him I don't have any personal sort of yeah. stories to add but um, you know he was a, a, a terrific player and and I mean is it's just I mean isn't the, what are the chances I suppose the Vox Pop you know throwing up someone who who is um, who? Who all the guests here, the other guests here, have an individual story about, and his brother is like a. The Irish football community is very small. Sometimes you are reminded of that. Stephen Kenny referenced the the small Irish football community in his speech the other day, which I think was very pointed in a particular way. Um, but here, yeah, you just can't you can't get away from him. I mean, he he can throw the chairman of a of a League of Ireland club under the bus in a viral clip as well, which was a uh, spectacular spectacular yeah. moment. Just the other thing, JD, um, you know, just I'm, I'm going to plug that piece again tomorrow. But I spoke to Johnny Glynn just about football in Galway. Um, there are 10,000, 10,000 uh, schoolboys and schoolgirls playing football in Galway now, in Galway City and County. And for Galway United to be back in the Premier Division next season is going to be incredible. Um, you know, every it's basically every away fan's favourite trip. But like we've had a long, long time of mediocrity. Um, I've been very critical of the management. Playing first division football has been very tough. And to have like the likes of Shamrock Rovers, Bohemian St. Pat's, uh, Cork City, Derry City back in Terryland next season will be great. And if you go, you're going to you're going to meet Don DC. Well, I just think the meet and greet with Don has to be the the, the function uh, uh, now. Uh, to be uh, honest, yeah, never mind all the others. You would have thought it would stuff. be with Johnny Ward, but it's going to be with Don. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah John, and, Johnny J- Ward. and JD and JD, we have another we have another version of it down in Cove Ramblers at the moment. I'm sure you've seen the, the stuff with Handsome Bob going around from no, the overlap. I haven't. With, uh, Oh, you, ha- you have to have a look at, at these clips from the overlap. Handsome Bob, who is, uh, I don't know what Bob's official title is down in Cove. I think it could be honorary president or something like that, something mad. But um, yeah, shot to fame massively, massively with uh, 
the overlap, his appearances on the overlap, he'd be he's very, very, very friendly with Roy and he he seemed to knock great crack. Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville seemed to knock absolutely brilliant crack out of him during the overlap and the whole lot. Um so yeah, last night it was mad. Roy Roy was at the game last night. Was Good he? game for him to come. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good game for him to be at. Have you met him? I, uh, Have you met him in your uh, role as Cove Ramblers manager? No, no, no. Roy, as you can imagine, he kind of keeps himself to himself. He doesn't go kind of bothering people. He comes in and comes out. But uh, doesn't ask really you joke. who you got relegated lately. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. But the, run, the running joke down around Cove last night was that there was far, far more people in the, in the place looking for Handsome Bob's autograph and photos of Handsome Bob than there was looking for, for Roy's autograph. Um, so look, it's just another... Another example of the great characters that are around the league. And, and by the way, Johnny Ward, just to state publicly so he can't back away from it, I was driving home last night uh, with the, the Waterford defeat in mind and I got a text from your chairman who stated in the text message, on account of Wilson scoring the winner against Waterford last night, I am now allowed to have him on loan for the remainder of the season for free. <laughs> so that, that's what the text said and I'm going to make him stick to it. Yeah. So what else happened this week? We were kind of mentioned before three o'clock the Saudi thing. It's becoming a bit odd, isn't it? Ruben Neves going for Madden. Well, I mean, Benzema and Golo Conte. You know, is this going to be another live? Well, I mean, look, um, and I've I've sort of addicted to the, the live stuff. You know, I'd be big into the golf and the whole intrigue around that, and got caught up on it all. And then that sort of mad sort of like, uh, oh well, actually, we're now all together moment, which was sort of incredible. So I remember being like disappointed at all the players going to live. That would have been my feeling. It's like God, you know, just your legacy for this. It's uh, you know pretty grim. I would have thought, and and I still think that. By the way, you know the whole sort of Saudi stuff. But I, I don't know what it is about the some of the hand wringing in the Premier League world over their players going to Saudi that I, I'm sort of amused by it I mean let's be honest like the Premier League is the best league in the world but the reason you know a lot of players like Ruben Neves came to play in Wolves in the second tier initially um, and why the Premier League is able to bring some great managers to places to clubs that you'd imagine you know they wouldn't have necessarily been massively attracted to a couple of years ago is money it's the power of the Premier League it's, it's middle Eastern money going around the place and now in some ways it's rebounding a little bit in the sense that the Saudis come to take their players in other ways it's all intertwined with the whole Chelsea Newcastle you know Chelsea managed to get rid of their you know they're sort of I don't know they're basically it's like taking the uh, taking your Christmas decorations to their recycling bin like you know in the first week of January they're getting rid of all these expensive purchases but they're getting money for them from Saudi which is I mean all seems perfectly legitimate, you know. Um, but now people are starting to think, God, they're actually starting to get some good players, some younger players. And it's like, well, you know, you've let them in the door to the Premier League, you know, and you've welcomed, you know, the, the, the influx of money there. And it's, that's helped, you know, the Middle Eastern money has helped the Premier League to create its competitive advantage over all the other leagues in Europe. But now they're deciding to bring some of them to Saudi. It's like, well, that's the game. Yeah, you know that's yeah. the game. So I, I want to be outraged by it all, but I'm sort of thinking, yeah, the, the football the football has got has brought itself to this point where this is what happens. You know, this you get is the, what happens. You get the maddest text into the show, Robin and Anna Scary. All right, Jedi, could you ask Shane Keegan if he's got a problem with players on his own team smoking or vaping? It is huge among young people now. Again, again, I love a little vape myself on a night out. Oh, it certainly wouldn't be ideal, Jedi. That's for sure. It certainly wouldn't be ideal. Uh, I would like to think that <laughs> if there is anybody who does smoke or vape, they're not stupid enough to smoke or vape around their manager anyway. They certainly, uh, I've, I haven't come across it. I can't swear that none of them do, but they certainly haven't been stupid enough to do it around me, that's for sure. But it's very much a, an in vogue trend at the moment, that's for sure. Hopefully, Stacey didn't have the window open all the way in the car <laughs> and figure out what was happening. <laughs> very good. <laughs> You're the man with the Celtic tattoo on your um, arm as well, Shane Keegan. Do you have any opinion on the Brendan Rodgers return? Yeah, no, look, it's it's a no-brainer, really, to be fair to them. Absolute no-brainer. Um, I, 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 to be honest, when, I'd, when it was kind of bounced around at first, um, I didn't think, I, I, I could completely understand Celtic wanting to make it happen. I wasn't so sure that um, Brendan himself would bite. I thought he might 
you know, I still thought his standing would be reasonably high that, you know, he could start the new Premier League season and wait for the first person to get the bullet and, and, and swoop in there, possibly. It's brilliant, uh, brilliant having him back at, at, at Celtic. It's a no-brainer. He did a phenomenal job there first time round. Look, I know there was a bit of a bit of grief and a bit of hatred and all that coming from certain elements of the Celtic support when, when he left that you know that kind of happens I suppose so it does but I think the vast majority of Celtic fans will be absolutely delighted to see him back um, even in terms of style of play again you know Postacoglu kind of built on on, on Rodgers' style they were extremely similar in terms of how they went about it anyway so it's it's pretty seamless move and uh, hopefully continues the, 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 uh, the dominance for a bit longer uh, Liam Brady uh, is uh, leaving RT Television, and I suppose it's an end of an era for the punditry. Uh, John Giles, Eamon Dunphy, Liam Brady is—is is, is punditry kind of going to change forever? Are we into a different world of punditry now? Um, oh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, p- p- possibly. I mean, I think you know, it's, 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 there's, there's a sort of a personal taste element to it. I mean, you know, like the Neville Carr thing has probably changed punditry to some degree. Like, um, you know, the this sort of off the cuff nature of the 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 former great player who will sit in studio just watch a game but not necessarily be able to say well I know this about this player and I know this about that player you know I think that's probably gone you know there's that sense of the people are probably there's a drive to be a little bit more analytical but in some people's eyes that's like um, you know a little bit uh, stayed you know it can be a little bit dull in, in other people's eyes I mean I don't know like well, I've like my views on the RT panel towards the end I wrote about it a bit like you know I didn't I felt it had reached a point where it wasn't for me anymore um, and and there was a change needed but obviously you know people would argue that it's gone too far the other way now and that's an opinion but I think like the Neville Carragher the more analytical type of stuff is probably the way it's going and probably that nature of sort of the off the cuff comment but I think that's probably reflective of life as well isn't it you know the type of uh it's a it's a more polished era, maybe. I mean, Brady was always a little bit separate to that, though, as well, right? Like in some respects, you know, the dynamic between him and Dunphy and Giles was probably slightly different to the dynamic with him suddenly when he was on. Let's say I don't know, sadly or, or her man, he became that senior, the senior pundit, maybe the occasionally the grumpier one. Whereas just with the Dunphy and Giles thing, it, they worked very well as a unit. Um, so yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's sad. Like, I mean, the, what I would say about Brady is that it was great to see the documentary. That it's a great was, documentary. And it got to see a completely different side to him. Because yeah. I think for a whole generation of people growing up now who would forget how good a player he was, but may, maybe only know him through the sound bites. You know, through the sort yeah, of fair through play, how he came point. across, so it gave you to see like a fuller picture of his of his character. You know, like so. Yeah, I, I think the RT panel in the last few years probably just weren't in touch enough with the game here and what was really going on. Um, but that was just my personal taste, my opinion on it. We have um, about ten minutes because obviously we're we're off air on football Saturday. We'll still be all, obviously have the show here one to five with a lot of Gaelic games coverage in the Women's World Cup over the next few weeks. But um, we're back on August the twelfth. But you know, for people that if there's not football on, you, maybe give us a recommendation around the League of Ireland game to go to. That's you know the experience, the the vibe of a game that that people might want to just actually go and get on a train or get in the car or, or get yeah. the bus and, and see a game. Well, Johnny will bring in. will somehow bring it around to Galway United yeah. again if we talk about that. And That's Shane, what I'm asking and you. Shane, and Shane naturally wants to bring people to Cove. See, I actually love the month of July football wise here because of the European games are coming around Shamrock the corner. Rovers. Like Shamrock, now the only problem is it's going to be hard to get tickets for some of those games, like particularly somewhere like Pats where they're they're going to be way above their um, demand levels. Sorry, you know they're not going to be able to cope with demand levels because they're not going to be able to have standing in their first round European game, which is going to be a problem. Ah, look, there's a great vibe around the league at the moment in general. Like I think last night again, you look at it, you like sort of good crowds around the country and and. It depends where you are, you know. This is the big problem. Like you see, there's there's a story developing now that there might be a team in Mayo has been introduced, which is brilliant because it's not a part of the country where we could talk about it here and someone could listen and say, well, yeah, that's great, but I don't have a team within two hours of me. So what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, like I think I think in Dublin there's great choice at the moment between Bows and Pats and Shells and Shamrock Rovers. Um, I don't know. Like I mean, it, it sort of depends where you're living. I think what you do find at this time of the year is that the league season becomes a little bit scattered in terms of fixtures and the European games 
like absorb a lot of the attention um, if people have the ability to uh, to travel and get the teller for one of the European games that would be terrific but I don't know I mean I think it depends where you're based but I think pretty much most of the clubs this season have, have got their act together or are getting better as regards like match day experience but the problem is like in certain places access to tickets is actually a problem they're not able to attract new fans or invite any more new fans in because their stadiums are too small like the Bowes Rovers game last night was terrific but there was like you know, a lot of people would have got, wanted to go to that game couldn't get a ticket and there's definitely no chance of a new person being able to go to that game so it just like drives home the point that all this stuff that's going on at the moment about facilities and infrastructure and stuff like the league has possibly reached a point where it's having one of its best season in, in years but it's almost impossible for it to develop much further because of the restrictions created by the facilities that exist you know but um, I would I would always recommend it to anyone um, but it, it's very much like geographically depends on where you are you know um, I don't know um, the Derby games are good but it's just hard to get into them you know but Johnny will just recommend going to Galway and just meet meet Don Deasy or maybe even Johnny Ward and there you go you know that's the ultimate match day experience you can have <laughs> Just enjoying the football, JD. Um, you know, mentioned Liam Brady. Like during lockdown, they showed the game in '74 where he was uh, playing with Johnny Giles in midfield. I think one of Giles' last games of Brady's debut against the USSR. And uh, to think that we were playing football like that in a bad pitch in Daly Mount uh, in '74. And all these years later, Daly Mount is what a capacity of like four and a half thousand people up from three and a half or whatever it was last week and our last year. And um, the facilities in this country are miles off, but everything else is is really positive. Um, you know the the underage thing is is fantastic. I think the quality of the players coming through is amazing, um, and some of the quality of the goals last night. Like I watched the League of Ireland. I know we've had a few dud games, mainly involved in Damien Duff of late, but some of the the quality of the games. You can bring anyone to League of Ireland game now, and he and she, he or she is going to enjoy it. Um, if I were to recommend uh, a ground to go to, I'd probably say uh, Inchicore because there's a reasonable chance you might get a ticket. You've no chance at Daly Mount at the moment. Tala um, is is great. It's kind of more of a modern stadium, but like Inchicore is very very friendly kind of atmosphere very um, like an old school kind of uh, ground uh, in, in Richmond Park and really good football and um, you, you know it's the League of Ireland's in a great place at the moment How many would go to a Cove that game then now is it uh, about a thousand would it be a little, little bit over that at the moment, JD. Yeah, I think we're averaging around 1,200 there, thereabouts. But I can assure you, we have a hell of a lot more space. So you will certainly manage to get into Coleman's Park on a Friday night. You need to worry about uh, tickets not being available. So uh, we would absolutely love to see new supporters coming in around around Cove. That's for sure. Um, it's mad. Like A couple of things work in our favour and, and, and sometimes against us. We would get the floating voter um, quite a bit. So, but the floating voter may usually opt for Cork City. So it's amazing. If Cork City are away, our attendance will go up a bit because it means that, that those that are into kind of keeping half an eye on League of Ireland soccer in Cork will, will come across to ourselves. Um, but we've even got things like, you know, if the GEA club are hurling or playing Gaelic football on a Friday night, even if Cove Wanderers, the junior soccer club, have a match on a Friday night in Munster Senior League, those kinds of things can actually hit our crowd. Um, last night we have a, we have a quite a loud and vocal group of kind of younger fans who sit in a particular section up the top, and there was kind of they were serial, drastically depleted last night. And I kind of turned around to somebody associated with the club and went, "Where's all the, the usual young fellas? Oh, there's two busloads of them gone up to Coda Line." So we got affected by, by kids going off to see Codeline rather than been at our game last night. But uh, these are the things you just kind of have to roll with, you know. I there's think actually if I was to recommend something to people as well, does yeah. the... Does the um, the one thing and I need to maybe do maybe what I might do at the odd Saturday or Sunday now because I'm not in here um, like some of the best underage footballers in Ireland are playing every weekend like you know under 17 under 19 level under 15 level some of these like Sight and Shamrock Rovers players and practically no one watching them you know like if you sort of download the FEI Connect app you can look up and see if there's an underage a national underage league game near you you will now see particularly like the, a lot of them are graduating up towards under 19 under 17 but like some of the best young talents in our country are often playing on pitches near you every weekend but like a handful of people scattered around the pitch and it's something I've tried to go more 
more in recent years but I mean the likes of Mason Mealy and some of these players in the under 17 Euros that people were very excited by I mean most of these lads are still here they're playing every weekend you know sometimes where are they playing? well I mean like you'd have teams and like Pats sometimes playing Kilbarrick United's base or um, some clubs use to play in the first team ground you know others will sort of play in I don't know university venues or whatever it might be but there is the FEI Connect app which is sort of a great resource for all the games that are on that you do actually sometimes need to sometimes just look up on a Saturday morning and see right, what what a national underage league games are on and you might be surprised I mean Shamrock Rovers often play in Rhodestown and you will see some good players there that's for sure and you will see players that in years to come you will go God I remember I remember seeing them as people who watched the young Evan Ferguson can now dine out on that for years they saw him um, before anyone else did uh, just some comments on YouTube great show says Keith thank you so much Keith for listening and watching and Bry Johnny Ward is the gold standard of punditry and analysis thanks to Don DC for that <laughs> yeah so Cork won 13 Roscommon 14 points coming to close in the preliminary quarter final down at Porky Cueve lads we've run out of time Shane Keegan Johnny Ward thanks for coming into the studio today remotely thanks JD <laughs> we're not coming Cheers, into the studio JD. Dan thank you no worries and I hope you enjoyed the hurling JD yeah no looking forward to it now and we've got uh, James Skell to look ahead to Clare versus Dublin and Goway versus Tipperary that has been Football Saturday so if you've enjoyed the football coverage over the last 9 to 10 months uh, please uh, continue to listen and also check out us on the podcast network through the Go Out network uh, on the off the ball section of that so Dan McDonald, Johnny Ward back on uh, August 12th ahead of the new Premier League season but right now after the break we're going to concentrate on hurling Clare Dublin and Galway to Prairie and James Scahill is at the Gala Grounds we'll speak to him next On News Talk Screen Time with John Fardy. This week on Screen Time, I talked to writer and director Gene Stupnitsky about the new Jennifer Lawrence sex comedy, No Hard Feelings, as well as his time writing on The American Office. Wes Anderson returns with his latest movie, Asteroid City, but will it keep his devotees happy? Plus, Broadway